Good morning, David. Good morning, James. Thank you very much for doing this again. It's about a year since we last talked to you on Henderson Pleasure. Program. Um, as usual, though, I think, I know, although you've done this before, it might be good just to sort of tie off with an introduction to the fund. So if you um, want to run through the slides you gave me, that'd be quite helpful. Thank you. Yeah, sure, sure. So if you, if you, James, if you move on to the first one, that's right. So, uh, so Henderson High Income, uh, I, I tongue in cheek kind of describe it as the uh, Ron Silver Investment Trust, because effectively it does exactly what it says on the tin, i.e. to produce that high level of income to shareholders, but also the prospects of capital growth into the longer term. And you can really see that on the chart on the right hand side there, just showing that the, the red line shows you what the dividend yield of the, of the trust is. And although we've seen obviously a, a spike higher in bond yields, in savings rates, et cetera, you know, the trust still trades at significant yield premium to all those other asset classes. And I think one thing that, you know, really differentiates this trust from, uh, from, from, from competitors really is it, it's the fact that it's an equity and bond uh, investment trust. So typical split would be 80% in equities, 20% in bonds. Majority would be UK, uh, but we can own up to about 30% uh, overseas. Um, if you go to the next slide, James. Um, in terms of the key attributes, so it is a well-established trust. It was launched back in 1989. And we generally have a long-term approach in terms of the companies we own. So a typical holding period uh, would be between say three and five years. And we're really um, focused not just on, on companies that pay a high dividend yield, but also ones that can uh, sustain that dividend uh, clearly uh, and grow into the longer term. And I'll sort of come on to, to talk about the importance of that uh, in a little bit. Um, I do have a strong, you know, I do, we do at Janice Henderson who run the fund, we do have a very strong income heritage. So I sit alongside the likes of Job Curtis who runs City of London Trust. I sit with James Henderson and Laura Fowl who, uh, run Lowlands and Lord Adventure, uh, and obviously Alex Crook as well, who, who, who runs Bankers. Um, not, you know, the trust has del obviously delivered a high dividend income over the last uh, 10 years or so since I've been on the trust. But one of the other things we've done is also generated uh, income growth for, for our shareholders. So uh, last year, we delivered uh, our 10th consecutive year of dividend growth. And over that period, that dividend has grown by a uh, 2% compound average growth rate. Um, so delivering on a high income, but also given uh, a little bit of dividend growth uh, to shareholders as well. Uh, next next slide, please, James. Um, now I talked about um, obviously our unique structure, uh, having the ability to own bonds. And I think one of the things that people need to get uh, comfort on is, is, is the gearing. Um, and because there's a structural element to that gearing, so i.e., um, you know, the bond portfolio is funded by uh, a, 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 a majority of the gearing within the uh, within the trust. So where I've got fixed rate borrowings um, and essentially with, a, with an interest cost of 3.7% uh, and invest that in a broadly stable portfolio of bond assets yielding closer to sort of five and a half, six percent currently, uh, actually that's a good way to generate that extra income for the trust. Um, once you strip out that, that element of structural gearing or, or the gearing that funds the bond portfolio, actually the gearing towards the equity uh, portfolio is around about eight, eight and a half, eight point six percent uh, as we are at the sort of end, of end of May there. So that's more the sort of traditional way of thinking about gearing uh, within equity trusts as well. So although there is a, you know, that other at the headline level, the, the gearing level maybe look optically relatively high to maybe some of the other UK equity income trusts in the sec in the wider uh, sector. Um, actually, because we've got the ballast, because of that majority uh, of that gearing is backed by a more stable portfolio of bond assets, actually, as you can see on the chart on the right hand side there, the overall volatility of the NAV uh, is not that too dissimilar to the wider UK equity market. So what I always say, just because it looks a relatively high geared trust, actually, because of the uh, makeup of the underlying assets that we own, actually, the, the overall volatility doesn't, doesn't, isn't as high as you would normally expect from that. And that's the one thing, a sort of key message I always uh, tell investors or potential investors to, to hopefully give them comfort on that. Um, in terms of what we look for, uh, 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 in terms of, you know, the companies that we own, uh, typically, you know, I kind of split the investment process into three parts. So first, it's all about fundamentals, really understanding what a company's key attributes are. Uh, and I think, you know, we have a bias towards good quality companies, whether that be um, companies that have robust, understandable business models, 
you know, that we want them well positioned in their markets, um, you know, to have strong brands or franchises uh, and good quality management teams as well. And I, I think, you know, taking a step back, it's about, you know, finding companies um, which are hard to compete against uh, and ones that can't be competed away, whether that's from traditional competition or new technology companies, et cetera, disintermediating them away. You know, we want our companies that we own to be, to be around in 10 years time and, and, and to be bigger as well. Then we look at the financials of a business, you know, really analyzing the financial health there, you know, how sustainable is are the profits, you know, are the companies investing enough in their own assets to grow over the longer term? Um, how strong are the cash flows? Because essentially we need strong cash flows to, to be able to pay those dividends uh, and also robustness of balance sheets. So, uh, you know, one of the key things that we, we really look for is that strength of balance sheets because, you know, all companies will get into, it will, will get into trouble, um, you know, get, whether it's a, the cycle, et cetera, or slow in the uh, economy, et cetera. But making sure you have a strong balance sheet means you can, you know, survive those those more difficult times and hopefully thrive in the longer term when recovery comes. We also look for companies that have sensible dividend policies. Um, you know, the, just because we're an income fund manager doesn't mean we want all the cash flow paid out for income. We want to make sure that our companies are investing enough uh, to grow their businesses, because ultimately that growing free cash flow means that that dividend is not only going to be sustainable, can grow into the future as well. And then the third part of the investment process is really about valuation. You know, it's all very well finding a good quality companies with good or improving financials. But if it's already discounted in the, in the valuation, then actually your capital appreciation is much more limited. So it's about finding good quality companies that have got good or improving financials, but being very disciplined on that valuation to make sure you are buying them uh, at, at cheap valuations or below where you think the intrinsic value uh, of that of those shares are really. Uh, next slide, James. Um, now I talked earlier about the importance of sort of dividend growth and dividend yield. And I think these two charts really sum it up for me. Um, the chart on the left hand side there that it's kind of split down between sort of dividend yield range over history. And what it tries to show you is that the black bar show you what you expected to receive uh, in terms of dividend yield. And the orange bars show you what you actually received at different levels of dividend yield. So as you can see that the higher the dividend yield or the further right you go on the chart, actually the less likely you are to actually earn that dividend yield. And that's because dividend, higher dividend yields uh, area of the market typically are companies that can't sustain those dividends and they're, they're, they're typically value traps. Um, that's why we kind of look for companies that can or that have a dividend yield range of between say two and four and four and 6%, because actually that's historically where you find dividends are much more sustainable. Um, if you look on the chart on the right-hand side, which looks at total returns uh, at different uh, dividend yield uh, levels, you know, that two to 4% range and that four to 6% dividend yield range actually produces the best total returns uh, over the longer term. That's, just, that's because it's, you know, the, the value of a company is really driven by not just the dividend yield it pays, but the dividend growth it, it produces as well. So those two combined make up your the majority of your total returns. And clearly those companies that pay a dividend yield between, between two and 6% obviously give you good dividend growth at the same time as well. And I think it comes back to kind of the overall structure of the trust, you know, having our ability to uh, utilize gearing, having our ability to own bonds, to boost that headline dividend yield for, for shareholders it means that actually within the equity portfolio, I don't have to be too far up the risk curve, really chasing those higher yielding areas of the market, where, like I said before, you get more dividend cuts, where you get more value traps, et cetera. So I can focus on businesses that can generate good dividend, uh, good dividend growth, and hopefully good capital appreciation at the same time. Next slide, please, James. So that was very much a uh, sort of brief introduction to the trust. I, I suppose I'll talk a little bit more about um, sort of market outlook going forward. And, you know, I guess the key debate at the moment, certainly in the UK market, is, is inflation. You know, clearly we, we're in a high inflation environment at the moment. And whereas you're seeing, you know, certainly in the US at the moment where inflation is starting to starting to fall from those very high levels, actually it seems to be quite stubbornly high in, in the UK. Um, what this chart tries to show you is some of the lead indicators we look for for inflation. So, you know, the orange bar shows you broad money, which is effectively just the amount of money that is circulating in the economy, in the UK economy. And um, clearly, as interest rates go up, 
um, there should be less money in the economy swashing around that's driving inflation. So these are typically lead indicators. So as you can see, uh, the orange uh, uh, line there has started to fall quite rapidly. Um, likewise, the blue bar, uh, which is producer output prices, i.e. The, the goods that manufacturers are making, what prices they charge. And again, you're seeing disinflation pressures coming through, which are generally good lead indicators. So it does feel like inflation is going to fall from the high levels that we're seeing. Uh, in the UK. Uh, next slide, please, James. But, that, but then the debate moves on to where does inflation settle? Uh, the chart on the, on the left-hand side there, it's, it's, it's called the five-year, five-year swap rate, but effectively what it shows you is what people think five-year inflation will be in five years' time. So it's a, it's a guide to where people in the market expectations are for long-term inflation. And I think it's safe to say that, you know, the market expects actually inflation to be, to remain higher than where we've been historically, and certainly above that uh, Bank of England 2% target um, that they have out there. And there's reason to suggest why that, why inflation should be higher going forward. Um, tight labour markets, certainly in the UK, um, you know, unemployment is very low at the moment, you know, you see in wage inflation come through. And I think that actually, because um, because of some of the curves and immigration, et cetera, I think that could continue. Uh, Deglobalisation, you know, globalisation over the last 30 to 40 years has really driven inflation lower. I think you're starting to see, you know, moves the other way. Um, you know, governments are being a lot more protectionist right now. Um, you're starting to see, you know, barriers to international trade, et cetera, which again will lead on to uh, higher prices in the, in the longer term. Uh, on, onshoring, I guess, is you know, similar, similar, similar arguments, deglobalization. So post the pandemic, you are seeing this move to, uh, from companies to bring manufacturing sites more closer to uh, the home markets. You know, certainly in the semiconductor industry, we're seeing, you know, a lot of the US semiconductor make, uh, manufacturers actually bringing uh, capacity back from Asia uh, where it's been cheaper and building um, facilities uh, it, it close to home in the US, et cetera, where actually because of those supply chains got so disrupted in the pandemic, et cetera, actually it's better to have certain amount of uh, capacity close to your home market. Again, that's likely to be inflationary. And I guess the last point is the amount of investment that needs to go in into green infrastructure. You know, there has been this push towards net zero uh, investment in uh, wind farms, solar, solar farms, et cetera. And actually given the, uh, the, the war in Ukraine, actually it's accelerated that move from uh, for, for, for governments and countries to uh, think about investing more to become more uh, secure in terms of their energy supply. So I think that's going to be inflationary as well, given the amount of investment that's probably chasing uh, uh, scarcer resources there as well. So putting that all together, I think it does mean that interest rate, you know, we, we're now in a different uh, era, really. I mean, over the last 15 years, we've been in a period of ultra low interest rates. I think that's changed now. I think we are going to go through a period where interest rates are, are likely to stay higher for longer. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. So, James, if you go to the next slide, um, the chart, you know, I, I, I'm sure most of you are probably aware how much the UK has underperformed global markets. You can see it there on, on the left hand side there. So, you know, that the black bar is the FTSE All Shares total return, that's and the orange bar is the MSCI World X UK. And obviously, you can see a, a material underperformance there while we've been living in that sort of ultra low interest rate environment. Um, and I think ultra, ultra low interest rates has been the real boom of US tech. I think that's been the key driver of the global indices you, you see on the chart there. Um, and it makes sense. So when we've been living in a um, low growth world, people are happy, happy to pay uh, high valuations for companies that can deliver good growth. So clearly US tech has been delivering that good growth. And it has been a case of valuations haven't really mattered. You just want to be buying companies for whatever valuation um, and just because they can deliver you better growth. I think in a world where interest rates stay higher, where your hurdle rate is so much higher, um, I think it becomes valuation becomes much more important. Um, and actually we can see from the table is, historically when interest rates have been higher, whether it be in the 70s, 90s, early 2000s, actually it's been a case where value has mattered uh, and the UK market, which is typically a, a more value-based market, has actually outperformed global indices. So actually the last 15 years or since the global financial crisis, 
actually that's been the exception to the not the rule in terms of what sort of style and what sort of markets have generally outperformed. So I think if you believe that we are going to stay in this sort of higher for longer interest rate environment, then actually that could be the catalyst uh, that, 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 that the UK does well. You know, I've probably been boring investors for a while saying the UK is cheap and everyone said, what's the catalyst? What changes that? Uh, actually, I think higher for longer interest rates will change that. Um, next slide, please, James. So yeah, I've, I've, so I just said it obviously just then about the valuations in the UK market and the chart on the left hand side there kind of shows it nicely, you know, valuations are cheap in the UK market across the market cap scale. So whether it's the, the mega caps of the FTSE 100 or the mid caps in the FTSE 250, PE ratios are back down to sort of levels we haven't seen, uh, you know, since the GFC or, or the Eurozone debt crisis back in sort of the early sort of 2011-12 there. Um, the chart on the right hand side one is is is, is when I, I stole off a strategist from Libram actually. He he looked at what valuation the the, the UK market has traded on in terms of PE price earnings ratio um, relative to history and different inflation ranges to try and work out you know what is what level of inflation is the UK market discounting. And what's interesting to me is that if you believe inflation is going to fall. Uh, which I think, you know, as, as we suggested on the earlier slide there, it does feel like it is going to come down at some point. But if even if it stays, remains higher than the 2% average from uh, the, the Bank of England's target rate, actually the UK market can still do well in that environment. It should re-rate. If you look at history, actually where we trade currently, it seems to be implying that inflation is going to stay higher forever. I just don't think that's going to happen given the falls we've already seen in energy prices, et cetera, and other, you know, food prices starting to come down as well. So if you think inflation falls below that sort of five and a half percent level, then actually there could be a re-rating story for the UK market as well. Um, next slide, please, James. So I very much talked about macroeconomics and uh, uh, market and valuations, et cetera. I always prefer talking about stocks because that's kind of more the day job. So this slide just talks about sort of, sort of two of the uh, new additions we've put into the portfolio this year. Um, so the first one is, is, is Money Supermarket. So this is obviously the price comparison website. Um, the chart, chart above the logo there, just on the left-hand side, just shows you uh, motor insurance quotes. So if, if anyone's like me, I got my quote through uh, for my car insurance uh, a couple of months ago, uh, and direct line were putting up by 90%, 90%, which I almost put off my chair at the time. Um, and I think what you've seen historically at high, high rates of inflation for car insurance and home insurance, et cetera, you see much more switching. And that's going to be the boom for, for moneysupermarket.com. Um, you know, clearly the market leading uh, price comparison website. It's a good business model. It's got high gross margins, given the, given the capital requirements are fairly low. It's got a very free cash flow and a pretty attractive dividend as well. So, you know, it's one we've liked. We think, you know, it's been in the doldrums for a while because switching, you know, because of low, you know, low motor insurance prices, actually, there hasn't been much switching. I think that dynamic where you're seeing high, high premiums coming through and high inflation, you're going to see much more switching come through. Also on the, on the energy side, obviously, given energy prices being very high, um, given there's been government subsidies, et cetera, there's been no switching in the energy side. Again, as we see energy prices fall, I think actually now you'll start seeing energy switching and people looking for more to fix their rates going forward. Um, and no, none of the analysts has got that anything, any sort of profit contribution from that side of the business as well. So I think that's a free option there as well. Um, the next new addition is, is DCC, which is a, a distributor. So one of the main divisions in the business is distributing uh, gas and oil to uh, homes that are not on the grid. Um, and I, and the chart, on, the chart on the slide there just shows you the D rating. So this is a valuation uh, that, that the shares trade at. And as you can see, it's, it's hugely D rated over the last five years of where it traded at high teens PE down to less than 10 times now. And that's because of the fear that, um, you know, that what happens to the business as people move away from traditional fossil fuels to more renewable energy, et cetera. You know, and I think what the market is missing is that the company has a very clear energy transition strategy. So um, for them, it doesn't really matter what fuel 
they are distributing to their own customers. You know, whether it's oil uh, or whether it's LPG, which is a, a, a gas that's lower emitting, whether it's biofuels in the future, whether it's hydrogen, you know, these are renewable gases, et cetera, they can distribute that through their current existing infrastructure with minimal capex requirements. So it's a business that has a credible uh, transition strategy you know, it needs, needs a limited amount of capex to execute that strategy. And yet it should be able to deliver, therefore, its continued high returns of invested capital that we've seen historically going forward, which is clearly given the derating we've seen in the shares, it's clearly not, uh, not being priced in. So very strong balance sheet, delivers high returns. Again, another attractive yield that has been growing and continues to grow. So it's got a 29 year track record in terms of dividend growth we think that continues going forward which again is, we don't think is discounted in the current valuation um, next slide please james um final slide i i, I probably won't talk but I'll, I'll sort of leave it up there just looking at the the current position in terms of sector exposure uh, and our top 10 holdings there but i'll, I'll probably pause there and uh, uh answer any questions that, that james or, or any of you listeners um have really Thank you, David. That's really helpful. Um, so first off, um, you've got the ability to invest overseas. I mean, you've, you've just made the case that why the UK might is, is cheap and, and why that, that might change. Um, so the exposure that you've got overseas, what's the attraction of that? And is that like to change one way or the other? Yeah. So so at the moment, we're around about 18 percent overseas. Um, half of that is within the bond portfolio. So I think what you find is that um, the UK bond market or corporate bond market is quite concentrated um, and, and in terms of liquidity as well, it's, it's, it's quite low at the moment. So we, we like to actually use the ability to go into the US uh, corporate bond market uh, where there's much, much bigger pools of capital there, uh, much more diversified away from financials where the UK market is overly concentrated, et cetera. So it gives us a broad way of certainly diversify and finding more opportunities within the bond market. I suppose where we go overseas in the UK market, again, it's kind of a concentration issue. So, you know, if you look at, you know, the energy sector, for example, so, you know, in the UK, you've only got two companies, BP and Shell, um, actually going overseas gives you, gives you an opportunity to, to own um, some more diversification. So we own Woodside, so the US, um, sorry, the Australian uh, energy company, which has much higher exposure to LNG, so liquidified natural gas, which we think has a much longer uh, uh, um, sort of sustainable uh, fuel than, than, than oil, uh, given it is seen as a, a transition fuel. Likewise, in pharmaceutical in the UK, you can only own uh, AstraZeneca uh, and, and Glaxo. Actually, we like to go overseas for Sanofi to, again, sort of diversify, you know, increase exposure to the, to the overall sector, but diversify in terms of the number of names that, that we own there. So that, that's kind of where we go overseas or where the um, where, quite frankly, there isn't those those opportunities for certain, certain exposures are in the UK. So we also own Texas Instrument, the US chip manufacturer. Um, again, there's not there's there's no chip manufacturer in the UK. So it's a, it was a good way of getting exposure to the growth we see in semiconducting chips um, uh, overseas. So that's so that's where we that's where we go overseas. And that's the typical reasons. OK, thank you. Um, a few questions now about the gearing in the bond portfolio. So firstly, uh, can you say a bit about how the gearing works? So um, how long is the sort of maturity on the structural gearing, for example? And then how does the tactical gearing work? Yeah, so 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 the structural gearing, so the, the, the fixed rate borrowings are a private placement note that we issued uh, back in 2017, uh, and it's termed out for... Uh, another 12 years from here um, so you know we've got a, still got a long way to go before we have to repay those um, and that's uh, like I said at the time it's 3.67 percent so it's um, so still you know given where interest rates have gone up to a five percent so it's very fortuitous that we did that got it away and actually you know we're still benefiting from using that utilizing that uh, um, uh, that those borrowings to invest in, uh, like I said, in, in the bond assets. I suppose the tactical gear inside of the argument is used through a, um, a bank facility effectively, uh, which has got a margin uh, of about uh, 110 basis points above uh, 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 base rates. So a bit more expensive that w now than we're seeing at the, at the moment. But like I said, if we're investing that in sort of high yield inequities or equities where we think we can get growth, 
actually that's still generating you know, or where valuations are particularly cheap at the moment actually that's still benefiting the portfolio to help um, you know help boost capital and income going forward uh, as well so those are the kind of two elements of uh, uh, of the side so structural gearing is kind of generate extra income tactical it's both income and capital growth uh, given where we see the equity market is particularly cheap right now yeah great thank you and um, within the kind of bond portfolio what sort of bonds do you hold are they uh, investment grade things um, what sort of maturities have they got um, do you try and manage any of the credit risks so um uh, the bond portfolio is, uh, in terms of the bond selection, is kind of outsourced to our bond team. So uh, John Patino and Jenna Barnard on our bond team. And we are kind of a mixture at the moment of investment grade credit uh, and a few high yield opportunities. Um, majority is kind of uh, investment grade credit at the moment. So generally triple Bs. Um, where we go into the high yield market, it's typically um, non-cyclical stable profile businesses um, that can command extra debt on their balance sheets. Um, duration at the moment um, is probably uh, between five and six years, I'd say. Um, so slightly shorter than, than, than where we are in the, the benchmark as well. Okay, thank you. Um, would the proportion of bonds within the structure, within the, the fund rise now, given that there's more opportunity to make high yields for them? Um, it's something, something that we're debating at the moment, uh, myself with, with the board, etc. cetera. Um, and it's one thing that we've been doing, uh, certainly over the last 12 months or so. I think we finished, uh, you know, 2021, about 9% of the bonds, 9% uh, of the NAV in bonds, and it's gone up to about 15% where we are today. So we have moved it quite a bit. Mm -hmm. I think from here, we just need to be mindful I think given given the valuation opportunity in equity on the equity side, I'm I'm still mindful that I, I still prefer some equities over bonds right now, especially because equities give you that inflation protection. You know, like I said, if we are going to stay in this sort of, you know, inflation, as I said, inflation will come down, but I think inflation settles higher. And I think clearly equities give you a better inflation protection going forward than bonds would right here. But it's, you know, we have been adding to it uh, and we keep it, you know, we certainly debate it at the, at the board level where we where we can or can't move it from here, I suppose. Okay. And um, one question I don't know if you have the answer to, but do you know what the yield on the portfolio would be without the bonds? So the, uh, the on an ungeared basis, the yield on the equity portfolio right now is probably about 4.8%. Okay. So you can see the difference it makes then. Yeah. Just trying to exactly, yeah. Good. Okay. Um, now let's move on to equities for a change. Um, there are a few specific questions on here. Um, let's start with the spread of the, the portfolio. Um, so how do you actually manage the position sizes? What, what, what determines that? Um, yeah, so it's, so it's, it's, it's a couple of factors, I suppose. Um, you know, Clearly, it's it's the underlying sort of fundamentals of the business, i.e., you don't want to have too high a position in a deep, you know, in a deep value cyclical, really, because they are inherently more valuable and um, more volatile. Mm -hmm. um, so effectively, you have bigger positions in probably, um, you know, your, your more stable defensive holdings, etc., whereas you have smaller holdings uh, in cyclicals because they are inherently more volatile. Um, I suppose the other point would be that um, where your conviction is, so you would probably have more in a stock that you have higher conviction in than, than, than less. Uh, so those are the kind of things you, you, you weigh up. I suppose in the overall, I suppose from an income point of view, um, you know, one of the things I didn't, probably didn't say earlier, but obviously, you know, we like to have a blend in terms of our portfolio. So, you know, clearly we have, you know, we have some lower yielders that probably offer you more in terms of dividend growth, but obviously uh, happy to own some of the high yielding names that probably offer a little bit of, uh, but probably less in terms of dividend growth. But it's about all about blending them all together uh, to get a, a good yield with good dividend growth prospects from the overall portfolio. Within that, so you've got a fair chunk of consumer staples. Are those on the sort of more expensive side of thing? Um, 
I mean, I suppose, you know, what I like about the consumer staples um, sector is because they do, and it's always been generally a core of the portfolio, because there are generally high quality companies that deliver a certain amount of certainty over your dividend growth. Um, you know, whether, where we, it doesn't really matter where we are in the economic cycle, generally they should be able to deliver good earnings growth, even if, even in a recession and can deliver dividend growth on the back of that. I suppose where we are at the point of the cycle, you know, are they a bit expensive? Um, you know, you look at Diageo, that's a high quality company that's delivering you, you know, five to 7% organic growth. Um, and it's trading on sort of 17 times earnings, which is a discount to, you know, some of the global peers. So on a relative basis, I think it's quite cheap. It's a good quality business. I think it's going to be, you know, it's been a long-term holding for us. Um, and if we are going to a more difficult environment for economic growth, then actually it should, on a relative basis, should still outperform. Now, at some point, there'll be a time to move more into, say, cyclicals, where there are, you know, where there are particularly interesting value opportunities in the UK market. Do I think that's today? Probably not. But as we go through in the second half of the year, that may be a switch that, that we're thinking about. But it wouldn't be a case of where we go to zero in staples, because again, I think, you know, they do offer you good quality businesses that give you, to, you know, good deliver, uh, reliable sort of earnings and dividend growth. We should put rates into that kind of cyclical bucket that, that might be interesting down the line. Uh, definitely, yeah. I mean, you look at, you know, some of the discounts they're trading out to NAV, um, you know, they are trading at, you know, historically very wide discounts. Um, now, you know, I guess the, the problem is people will worry whether, you know, off, are people, you know, now post pandemic, you know, more of a trend to work from home, etc. Um, you know, are those are those property values in office space reliable, etc. Question mark for today, but you know, 35 40 percent discounts seem to apply pretty negative uh, view of where well, it has a very negative view about the company can't do anything about it. You know, clearly, they can, you know, you know, it's a it's effectively it's a property where you can change the usage or, or make it more of a shared, shared usage, etc. Things like that. So, there's things that companies can do, and I just think, you know, on a on a fundamental basis, they're probably too cheap here given the discounts to an AV. So, you know, we like land securities. We've continued to add to it um, given where the valuation is. But on the other side, we like things like big yellow group as well. So self-storage, more in a sort of structural growth uh, dynamic there. Um, and, you know, I think they've got good visibility over future earnings growth given the, the build out of their uh, development pipeline there, which, you know, generally generates a very good payback for them as well so you know it's an area we like again valuations of you know share prices have been weak and i think that creates the opportunity for shareholders mm -hmm. um question here says you've got a sort of relatively neutral rating to energy is that something you think you might increase um i i do worry a little bit uh on energy just because um you know, there is obviously there is this trend away from obviously fossil fuels and still the majority of their profits are derived from oil effectively. Um, they do have, um, you know, they, they do have good credible transition plans over the very long term, clearly. But the one thing I do worry about is, um, is actually the returns they're going to be going to be making so your you know your typical uh, wind farm will generate a return of say six to eight percent um an upstream oil and gas project will generate a typical return of say 20 percent so you're sh over the longer term you're shifting your business from say 20 percent return in assets to more like six to eight percent and i just feel that actually on that journey for shareholders it, it you know it, it it just means that you're going to be a lower return in business in the very long term. Now, it's exactly the right thing they should be doing for society, etc. I just think for shareholders, it has question marks over the sustainability of that cash flow and dividends. I think where we are today, you know, actually valuations are particularly cheap. You know, free cash flow yields to 15%, material discount to where, say, some of the US oil companies trade at. Um, etc. So that's why I've, I'm, you know, I, I am where I am in terms of the holding in the in the sector. I just worry a little bit longer term about the sustainability of those returns and and where cash flows can come in the longer term. 
Uh, hence, hence why I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sort of equal weightish. Yeah, cool. Can you talk us through the attractions of 3i? Because it's obviously quite a big position in the portfolio. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the, the 3i is obviously a private equity company. Um, its main holding is a deep discount retailer called Action uh, across Europe. So if you've ever been to uh, France, Holland, et cetera, you, you may have seen it. Um, and what I like about the business is it's, a, you know, it's a very quality business, you know, strong quality business model, i.e., um, you know, it offers low prices, which drives, uh, drives more and more volume. And through that more and more volume, you have become, you get more purchasing power with, uh, with your suppliers. So you can, re you can get more purchasing synergies and you can reinvest that in lower prices, drive extra volume, et cetera. And that sort of, you know, it just perpetuates that circle, et cetera, of, of, of values. And, and the interesting thing to me is um, Action is the biggest buyer of Coke in Europe. Um, and hence, hence why they get, um, you know, huge amounts of buying synergies. You know, I, I looked online and I think, uh, uh, was it 500 milliliter bottle of Coke uh, is about a 30% discount in action than it is in Tesco's in the UK. That's the sort of um, pricing that we're talking about. So deep discount. It's growing like an absolute weed at the moment. So it's got 2,000 uh, stores across Europe. It thinks it can go at least double that. And each store has a turnaround, uh, you know, cash cash turnaround of about, or payback rather, of about one to two years. So it's a quick turnaround. Um, so it drives incredible returns on, uh, on equity for the business. So uh, we like it. It's done very well this year. We, we've, we've sort of lowered that position into that strength, but let's continue to like it longer term just because of that growth of, of action, which is the dominant asset uh, within the mix there. Your biggest position is BAT. And I know that some people would prefer not to invest in tobacco type stocks. Um, do you think that makes a difference to the popularity of the fund or not? Um, uh, I mean, I think you've, I suppose you've got to be clear, haven't you? I mean, it's not, it's a, it's a trust that doesn't have necessarily have any restrictions about what it can and can't own. I think what, what I like to do though, is to make sure that the companies are doing the right things in making sure when we invest in them, that they're doing the right thing to make sure they're going to be sustainable in the longer term. Um, you know, clearly smoking or traditional cigarettes is a declining market. It's been declining for the best part of 40 years. Um, but, the, you know, the companies aren't sitting on their hands, not doing anything. You know, BATS is one of the biggest investors or has been the biggest investor in, uh, you know, reduced, reduced harm products such as vaping, such as heat, not burn, et cetera, modern oil, things like that. And I think as long as they're doing the right thing in terms of investing in those new growth, growth areas, so that actually the growth of that can offset some of the declines in, uh, in traditional cigarettes. They're doing the right thing for society. Actually, they're doing the right thing for shareholders as well. So I'm happy to own those types of companies, especially given the cash flow um, yield on these businesses are incredibly high. I think they're materially under, you know, undervalued in the market. Um, and I think there's, you know, there's good upside to, you know, because I think there will be people who come in and start buying them and start recognizing those free cash flows are undervalued. Um, and I wouldn't want, you know, my shareholders to miss out by, you know, selling at such a low price when I think it's materially undervalued. Okay. Thank you. Um, just one last question. Um, you're uh, in a sort of sector by yourself within sort of the way that ARC classifies you because you've got the, both the equities and the bonds with the portfolio. Do you, do you think that is a, potentially a problem in terms of people finding the fund um it's a good question i i think again it's something we debate at the board level uh board meetings quite a bit um with the directors i think the i think it kind of plays into our uniqueness right so you know we are an equity and bond fund that there's not no real other trust like us so why not be in a be in a sector of one um you know, yes, there's a potential that we get missed, uh, but effectively we do go out of way to try and market the trust to get our name out there in the press, et cetera, um, and things like that to make sure that, you know, you know, we are, we do get noticed by, um, uh, to, to investors, et cetera. And certainly when you look at the, you know, the premium discount, you know, we're, we're trading at a, um, you know, a small premium at the moment. We have done consistently for the, for most of this year 
which would imply that actually maybe you know we aren't going unnoticed um really so it's again the thing we debate i don't you know i think i think the risk is that you move into say the aic uk equity income sector and you know you, that's a sector with 22 other trusts so you may get lost just in that sector as well um and likewise if you you know could you move into a, a predominantly bond sector well i don't think that fairly reflects the the make the, the makeup of the assets within our trust given we're mainly a uk equity trust so uh, you know I, I feel pretty happy staying where we are great thank you very much david um i think there's still questions coming in, but actually we would probably stop there um but no really helpful and um we'll uh write on you quite soon i think okay um, not a problem yeah. okay um we'll be back Next week, talking to uh, Ian Lance, who's one of the managers of Temple Bar. Uh, and then, as I've said before, we've got a sort of full lineup of people for you over the summer. Uh, so we're not taking a break. Um, so have a good weekend, and we um, look forward to seeing you next Friday. Thanks. Bye bye.